All right. Hello, world, and welcome to this edition of the Vaden webinar. Today, I have with me Josh Long, who probably does not need any introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. Good friend and uh, Spring developer advocate. Welcome, Josh. Hey, buddy. Thanks. Good to see you. So yeah, I'm super excited to have you on and talk about something that's really interesting to me, which is all the cool new things that Spring Boot 3 and 3.1 bring with them. So very much excited to see kind of uh, what you have in store for us. Oh yeah, I'm super excited too. You know, it's been it's been a a, a recurring theme for you and me and the team uh, uh, to sort of converge uh, <laughs> every now and then to talk about all this cool yeah. stuff. You know, more than a decades long uh, friendship, you know, and partnership. Yeah, so, I remember we. It's it's literally been probably a decade since we did our first kind of collaboration. So it's great to kind of have this long ongoing kind of tight relationship between the teams building cool stuff together and like making sure they work really well together. All right. So uh, for everyone on the stream, a couple of quick uh, notes on how we're going to run this. So we have the lines muted because we have quite a lot of folks joining today, but you can ask questions to, uh, using the questions panel in the lower uh, right hand side of your screen. And we're going to answer those questions towards the end of the, the webinar. So Josh is going to do a lot of very cool live coding stuff. And if we start bombarding him with questions during that, we'll throw him off and he might drop down to 1.0 speed from his like normal 2.0 speed coding. Uh, we will send you a link to the recording and everything in about a day or so. And we'll post this on YouTube as well after that. So if you want to revisit anything, want to watch Josh code on a slower speed so you can keep up that's your chance to do that. All right. Um, so if anyone here is joining from outside the Vaughn community, first of all, welcome, welcome. Very great to have you here. Uh, so what we do is we help folks who are running Java build great web experiences. Uh, for that, we have two frameworks. We have Vaughn Flow, which lets you build web applications 100% in Java, something we're going to play around with a little bit today with Josh. And then we have another framework called Hilla, which uh, type safely connects a Spring Boot backend with a React front end. Uh, that's not something we're going to talk about today, but it's good to know that that's there as an option as well. We have some earlier videos with Josh if you want to check out uh, Hilla. So uh, before we get started, before I hand over to Josh, let's do a couple of polls just to get a feel for who we have on the stream today. So let's get those polls running uh, in your lower right hand. Uh, panel again, you're going to see this poll icon and it should light up with a question. So we are interested to understand what version of Java are you using? Are you still on eight or perhaps even older, uh, 11, 17 or 20 or something newer? So let us know what you're running right now. Very interested to know. Okay. So we still have, uh, Results rolling in. We have 17 in a very commanding lead of 53%. So makes Josh happy. In second place, we have, care to uh, guess, Josh? Uh, I'm scared. 11. Let's say 11. Yes, you are correct. Uh, and in third place, we have eight or older and a few early adopters of 20 and later. So that's good. We have a Pretty kind of recent set of uh, technologies being used here. So, all right. Um, the other question I had in mind is what version of Spring Boot are you using, if any? So are you still on 2.x? Are you already on 3? Are you not using Spring Boot at all? And you somehow just wandered in here to see what, what the fuss is about? You're in the right place, if that's the uh, situation. I'm assuming a lot of you are using uh, Vaughn and uh, fewer are using yeah. Okay, so we have well over 100 votes coming in with Spring Boot 2 in a lead with 45% mm -hmm. of users. So it makes sense. Like Spring Boot 3 didn't come out all that long ago. So still kind of folks upgrading. But Spring Boot 3 is, does seem to have quite a bit of uptake already with 38% of folks already running it. So that's cool. And we have 16% of folks who are not using Spring Boot. So welcome to you too. Very great to have you here as well. All right, and 
finally, uh, we are asking about which build tool you're using. So specifically, whether you're in Kemp Maven or Gradle, what's your take on this, Josh? I, I know you're a longtime Maven user, recent Gradle yeah, I mean, tester. I, there's no hill here for me to die on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's whatever. Just get to production. <laughs> that's a very pragmatic and good good approach to it, I think. All right, so we have a uh, 76% Maven, Camp Maven here, and 24% uh, Gradle. So kind of a clear winner here in terms of raw usage numbers, but I know that you recently changed the default on Spring Initializer, so maybe that'll change over time. Not me personally, but yeah. It, the well, I mean, yeah. Passive voice, it was changed. It okay. <laughs> I was thinking more like you in general, like yeah, you folks, not too. like third person you. <laughs> all right. Well, that's great. Thank you all for answering. That gives us also an idea of who we have in the audience. And um I will hand it over to Josh and his live code demo. So take it over, Josh. Okay, very good. Well, my friend, I, I do want to say thank you again for having me here today. Uh, I was I, I registered this in the beginning, but it is, it is, you know, I've been, I was thinking about it before the show. We, you and I, have been doing this uh, for for years, and then just in general, the Vaden team, along with the Spring team, has had uh, a, a good friendship and a good partnership. Uh, you know, since 2011 at least, right? It's been a long, long fruitful sort of relationship and that's okay that's a good thing it's good to have long stable uh communities that have worked and, and benefited from each other for years and years and to that end it's worth mentioning i think uh that java just celebrated its 28th birthday yesterday that's another amazing milestone spring framework celebrated its 20th birthday on the 18th of may spring boot it, roughly its 10th birthday so you know these are technologies that have endured for years and years and years and that makes them uh, really, really compelling, right? What I want yeah. is boring. I love boring. Boring is how I get to production uh, with ease and comfort and and sort of tranquility. And so to that end, being honest with you, my friend, I love Spring and I love Vaden because they're boring, right? They yeah. just well, use I them. Mean, there's nothing the wrong with having time off in your weekends and evenings, not <laughs> it's great, right? putting out like, fires. And also it's nice to write in a language that has a has a type system. You know, I'm a big fan of like a coherent or at least a the beginning of the semblance of a type system, right? I'm, uh, yeah. you know, me. I, I've written, I've written JavaScript. <laughs> Get it out of my mouth! Disgusting. I've written JavaScript before, but I'm not really a big fan, and it's not a real big fan of me. I like my Java, uh, and I like just being able to put together applications really quickly. And for that, to that end, you know, Vaden's great. Really works great. So, um, you know, Vaden Flow in particular, not the, you know, do we? It used to be called just Vaden, right? Like now we call it Vaden Flow. Is that the idea? Yeah, exactly. So. So, I mean, once when we only had one framework, it kind of makes sense. But then, if like, yeah, and yeah. also the company's called Vaden, so right. there's a little bit of Using. like name overloading going on here. Naming so, is hard. It's the very it, hard it is very hard. Um. Okay. So, friends, let's talk about. Let's start. Let's let's just get into it. I guess share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Share my screen. Um. Share. Very good. All right, my friends. We're gonna build a new Sweet. application. You can see my screen. We can see your screen. Sweet We're not going to redo the thing that I did at San Francisco Jug a couple of months ago where I got to like 20 minutes in before anyone told me on the stream that I wasn't sharing my screen. Oh, no, but that's not that. <laughs> it's definitely not. All right. My so friend, we can see, gonna... you, see you clearly here. Go ahead. Uh, very good. Okay, we're going to build a brand new application here at start.spring.io. Obviously, my second favorite place on the internet, my first favorite place, as anybody who knows me knows, is production. I love production. You should love production. It should go as early and often as possible, bringing the kids, bringing the family. The weather's amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It is better than Disneyland. But if you haven't been to production, you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. Now, friends, we're going to build a new application. Uh, I'm going to use the latest and greatest version of Spring Boot, which just released on the 18th of May, so you know, six days ago. <clears throat> called 3.1.0. We're going to use the newly defaulted, as Marcus just mentioned, the newly defaulted Gradle uh, build tool. But again, well, you know, we don't really care which one you're using. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm I'm spending some time this year trying to learn uh, to, to learn Gradle. I, my New Year's resolution, I said I'm going to learn Gradle and lose some weight. And I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely making progress on Gradle, right? Gradle's coming along quite nicely. It's not bad. I'm. It's fine. It does the job for me. Uh, we could use Kotlin or Groovy or Maven. 
uh, or and, and indeed for language, we have a lot of choices here as well. Spring Boot and Vaden don't really care either which way. We're also going to name our artifact Vaden, okay? Because again, I'm I'm great with names. Uh, I get that from my father. My father, we had a little white dog, and my dad named it White Dog, and then that that dog disappeared, and then oh, I don't know, ten years later. Uh, with that, that first dog went to a farm upstate, I don't know where, uh, and then magically another white dog appeared at our door, and my dad, I'm not kidding, named it Two, which is a, I don't know, I, I don't know if he meant like T-W-O or T-O-O, but either way, it kind of worked, and uh, and to this day, my mom reminds me that I should be very grateful that uh, that she named me and not my father. So uh, we're going to go ahead and add some support, we want the Gravium native image support, we want the Vaadin support, we want the reactive web support and the web support. We want the um, Spring Data DDBC support, we want the uh, uh, the Postgres support, we want test containers support, and we want dev tool support, okay? So these are just a few of the things we're gonna use to build our application. And then of course we have choice the choice down here of what version to use uh, for Java. Now, you know, we, I see that half of you are doing the right thing, but friends, while it may seem like you have four choices down here, you really only have two choices. Remember the current required version of Java to use Spring Boot 3.x uh, and Spring Framework 6.x is 17. So these other two checkboxes are just here for the lols. They're just here for the memes. They're just here to see who makes terrible life decisions. You should never ever choose these. These are not choices. They're choices that you could make, but that you should never ever make, not even when you're trying to be ironic to show people what you should not do. Friends, I hope you're on Java 17 or later. And remember, Java 21 is just around the corner. Java 21 brings Project Loom. Project Loom means that you can take an already an amazing Vaadin application built on the servlet stack and then take advantage of the new green virtual threads and, and get really, really great parallelism, really great scalability uh, for basically for free. You just swap out an executor uh, yeah. or a thread pool basically. It's just a and really- worth mentioning cool. that's the next upcoming LTS as well. Yeah, next, next LTS, less than six months from now. It's a big deal. So Java 17 and later are amazing. They're technically superior to Java 8 in every single way. They're faster, more observable, more container ready, more uh, syntax rich, more uh, secure, more operations friendly. They're technically superior in every single conceivable way. They're also morally superior. You're not gonna like the look of sadness and despair in your children's eyes when they find out that you're using Java 8 in production. Don't do it. Be the change you wanna see in the world, do the right thing. And just judging by the version number alone, I think we can agree that Java 17 is more than twice as good as Java 8, right? Just to, just just more than twice as good, just judging by the number alone. So I think, uh, I think I've made my case. I'm just gonna leave it there. We're gonna go ahead and hit generate and open up the zip file in our IDE. Um, and you can use any ID you want. In fact, uh, Marcus and I, we had a go at running this th all through uh, uh, Visual Studio Code yesterday because, you know, we're hipsters. And uh, it worked. It was great. Like, really good experience, really fast. You know, whatever you want. Anything works. Nothing special required here. Uh, this is going to take some time indexing uh, because, it, you know, it's, it's very clearly the very first time it's seen any of these types um, in the last minute. And so it has to re-index. Come on. Okay, good. Vaadin. So what we're going to do is we're going to build an application that's going to talk to a database. We're going to work with a concept of like a post, like a blog post or something like that. And it'll have a post ID, right? And we're going to create some entities here. Uh, and we're going to have a title and a body. Okay. And this is going to be a, just our entity, right? I love uh, records. I just love them a lot. And they just make things more concise. We're going to create a post repository to manage persisting instances of this, right? So list crud repository, uh, post, uh, okay, integer, All right? There we go, there's our type. So we're gonna create a repository to persist instances of this of this data type. Um, and we're gonna talk to a database, right? We're gonna talk to a database. Uh, and I, you know, normally at this point, I would go to my property file and I'd create a new property file called application dash dev.properties or something like that. And I'd plug in some spring data source URL, password, username, et cetera. Uh, and then I'd have a little script called run me.sh or run.sh or dev.sh or whatever, where I would do Docker compose and stand up an instance of a database. And then I'd, then I'd be able to start writing the code, right? But that very much flies in the face of that git clone run experience that we all hope to have. Uh, and so in Spring Boot 3.1, we have now very good support for 
test containers, right? Test containers at development time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here and delete the support for that existing test. Uh, we're going to create a new uh, test Vaadin application. So I'll go here, test Vaadin application. Uh, and this test Vaadin application, you know, uh, is just a public static void main application. I'm going to defer, I'm going to say, I'm going to defer to uh, uh, the existing instance, I'll say from uh, Vaadin application. Main, and then we'll say with, uh, we're gonna, you know, we're going to say run it with these arguments. And these arguments, I think we can all agree, uh, are poorly named. Um, so we'll fix that. All right, there we go. Uh, and then we'll say uh, we want to run it. And we want to, what we want to do is we want to run the application context in the test code with an extended configuration, right? With a new configuration class. And that'll be this very class in which we find ourselves right now. And uh, so I'll say at configuration, like so. And I'll put that on the class uh, there, OK? So that, what that does is it gives me a place where I can now define development time only uh, things. And one of the things I want to define is a test container, uh, which is an API for working with Docker images for common infrastructure. So I'm going to use the Postgres container, right? And I'll say return new Postgres instance. And look at that. C control space inside of IntelliJ. I get you know the versions and then Docker images and all that stuff. And there's you know it's a fluid DSL. I could do with DSL with with database name, with password, with username, uh, etc. All sorts of things there. Um, this is going to be a Docker image, and I want Spring Boot to know to connect to this. I don't want to have to create a Spring that data source your username, password, etc. And thankfully, with Spring Boot 3.1, we can use the Spring Boot will automatically use the Java API to talk to the Docker daemon to ask it, hey. Do you, have a, do you have an instance of this container called Postgres? If so, is it running uh, and is, you know, does it match the one that we created here? Uh, and if so, I want to learn how to connect to that. And we can tell Spring Boot to do all this with the at service connection annotation. So it's going to draw its connection credentials from that. It will infer that relationship. Okay. Now, the thing is, we're also going to be using dev, tool, dev tools, which are a great way to sort of live uh, uh, update our code as we're developing. Um, and we want to make sure that the container doesn't get re reset every single time we make a, a change and then reload the uh, the app. Okay, so we're going to turn our dev tools in dependency to this new scope of test implementation. That will allow us to see this restart scope annotation, uh, which will then tell Spring that this bean should endure, it should survive the restart rather than getting reset each time. Very very convenient for sort of productivity purposes. So we've got this um, and. We're going to create an application. Like I said, it's going to talk to a database. Obviously, with a database, we need some schema. So I'm going to tell it to initialize uh, the schema that we find here in resources. Uh, in the resources directory, we're going to create a SQL file called schema.sql. We'll say create table uh, if not exists uh, post host id int right. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, primary sorry serial primary key. We'll say text. Um, Title is going to be text, uh, and body is also text. Okay, so we're creating a, a schema, a table for our schema that'll get created every single time the application resets. And because of that, we've taken some care to make sure that it's idempotent. That is to say, it updates or creates if it doesn't exist. Okay, so with all that in place, um, what I want to do is in our production code, I want to go through uh, and you know have this thing talk to our uh, an API to get the post data to bootstrap the, the, the application. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a post client. Now, I could do this the old-fashioned way. I could cre create a post client like this, a post API client, uh, if I wanted to. I could do something like that, no problem at all. Uh, I could you know, maybe use the REST template or the web client, right? I've got this here, uh, I think. And that's because I've got, by the way, both the reactive web and the web support there. I could do all sorts of things like this, but the problem is, my friends, this sounds suspiciously like work, and I don't like work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of a new feature in Spring Boot uh, 3.x where I can now declaratively create a client, so post client or post API client. Uh, and this supersedes sort of the support you might have seen from Spring Cloud Open Vein uh, and things like that. I'm going to describe uh, you know, how to get all the posts here. Uh, and I'll say I want to get the data from the endpoint, and I'm going to use these client-side mapping annotations, right? So at get mapping, uh, etc. This annotation uh, will tell us how to make a request to the, uh, you know, to the service. It's client-side peer to the get 
uh, sorry, Git exchange is what we want. Git exchange is what we want. That's the client side peer to the server side Git mapping. So I'm going to say whenever somebody invokes that method on an implementation of this interface, all forward slash posts. Now the question you might have is, you know, to what endpoint, to what service am I making that request? And that, friends, is something we flesh out here in the bean configuration. Okay. So we're going to build uh, a, a an application that injects the builder. We'll say builder.base URL, and this is going to be pointing to JSON placeholder dot typicode dot com. Uh, and then we're going to build that instance. I'm going to use a WCA. We'll say web client adapter dot for client WC dot. Uh, and then we're going to say we're going to return HTTP service proxy factory dot builder passing in the web client adapter. Uh, and we're going to build it, and then we're going to create the client for this interface. Now, most of this work, my friends, you can save uh, or sort of centralize in your code and then reuse. Really, most of them can be cached. You can define this as a bean, the HTTP service proxy factory, and then just inject that and call dot create client, assuming you have the same root endpoint, and maybe you could even have it parameterized. Either way, uh, it, it seems like a lot because I've just got one interface, but you would reuse most of this logic. Uh, okay, so we've got our uh, client, we've got our interface. Uh, I, I want to now use that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bean uh, of type application runner here that will initialize when the application starts up. Uh, and when the application starts up, we're going to inject this post API client. We're going to inject the post repository that we just created. Um, and we're going to visit all the data like this. So I've got a collection. So posts. I want to save that into the database. So I'll say repository.save all posts. Now, of course, I might have, uh, you know, I might actually just sort of inline that, no problem, uh, just to keep things clean so we don't have a proliferation of extra data, uh, just to keep it all sort of in, in, in our demo happy spot. We're going to do uh, repository delete all. Okay, there we go. So we've got our, our basic application. Um, we've got the uh, repository, we've got the application runner, we're initializing the data, we've got the schema, we've told Spring Boot we want to initialize the schema, we've got the test container support. Let's go ahead and try it out. We're going to run this test main method, OK? So we've got dev tools in the background. And what that's going to do is it's going to spin up. It's going to actually download the Docker Compose. It's going to download the Docker image, right? You can actually see it uh, taking its time there. Uh, let me see. Here we go. Um, Docker client provider strategy using local Unix socket. Docker host IP is local host connected to Docker. Uh, you know, test containers, Ryuk. It's actually doing all that when the application starts up, right? So it, it takes a fair bit of time. Uh, but the nice thing is, of course, you know, now we've got dev tools and we can dramatically shorten that time, right? So uh, here, um, let's say I wanted to visit all the records that I get back. I can say find all dot for each and then just print out each record like this, okay? So I'm going to do command shift F9, okay, friends? So if you go here in IntelliJ, it's kind of weird because we're not used to having to manually compile in IntelliJ, but you do recompile command shift F9, Command Shift F9. You could also do this or this, right? Either one works, but Command Shift F9, I find is it just seems to be the best for me. I'm going to do that. And you can see down there, it says building bottom. So it's actually compiling at the moment, right? It's doing the recompilation. And what, what's happened there is that uh, that causes Spring Boot to sort of, it's, it causes the dev tools to throw away the current application context, resetting everything, right? Uh, but it doesn't restart the JVM because much of the time that we spend trying to build a new application is in resetting the JVM, OK? So we, we don't have to do, worry about that. It's just there's all of our data, right? And now it's been saved in the database. So actually, what you're seeing here, friends, are, are the results that we got when we queried the database after we called the HTTP API. So it took a little while. But remember, that's because it's calling a network service, getting all the JSON, uh, JSON data, and then writing it out to the database here. And then we're querying the database. All that happens at startup time, OK? So what does this have to do? With Vaadin. Well, Spring Boot is a great way to build a backend API, right? We can move very quickly. We have dev tools to do live reloading. Uh, you don't have to restart. It's very fast. Uh, you've got this test container support, so you can easily uh, uh, pull together lots of different uh, infrastructure very, very declaratively. You know, there's also similar support um, for Docker Compose. So if that's your jam, that's great too. You just put, you just add Spring Boot uh, Docker Compose to the class path uh, in test implementation uh, or, or you know, development only rather, uh, and then, um, you know, add a file called docker-compose.yaml in the root of your directory here. Um, and um, 
you'll get you'll get uh you know you'll get all this stuff you'll get an automatically started instance for yourself um good stuff good stuff um so we have everything that we need here let's talk about vaden what i want to do now is i want to make this application uh, a view and so a lot of times you know i noticed that i didn't set up an http api um we didn't we have to set up a, i didn't set up an http api here i didn't set up like a GraphQL, you know, I, there's lots of great things you can do uh, with Spring to build backend uh, endpoints. But again, with with Vaden, it it's just so much more productive to sort of sidestep all that, right? I can get the best of both worlds. I get a nice, rich, interactive, dynamic client in the browser uh, without making any compromises in sort of how I build my applications on the back end. So I have the full suite of support there. And so to that end, I'm going to use uh, I'm going to create a new component here called Posts View. It's going to extend the vertical layout, okay? Vertical layout, and I'm going to inject, you know, my repository here, my post repository, okay? So it's just a regular bean. It's going to have a route that tells uh, Vaden that this is going to be just basically forward slash. I could put, you know, like hello, um, you know, like I could put something like that uh, there. But I'll just do quote quote, uh, and I'm going to inject the uh, in the constructor using Spring. I'm going to inject the collaborating dependency. The post repository, and I'm going to use that to initialize uh, the data that gets shown. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'll have uh, an H1, which is a just like an, it's an H1 element, you know, just a very simple element here. Okay, and uh, let's see, get rid of that. So um, uh, let's see, posts by your favorite AI. Okay, so there's our our simple H1 element, uh, and then I'm going to create a data grid. Okay, so a new grid, new grid. Uh, for, uh, of type post, managing posts like this. Okay, R grid. Good. Whoop. Whoop. Good. And then I'm going to add some data. I'm going to add some columns. So I'll say set items. First of all, I'll point that to the repository at find all. Uh, and then I'll say grid dot add column. Uh, and I want to say post, post ID, set header is the post ID. Obviously, you can use Spring's internationalization support here. Um, body, or I guess text is probably more natural there. So uh, body, and then the uh, the title, right? Maybe we want that first, uh, and so the title. Okay. So there's our text, and I want to add these two different components, the grid and the H1, to the vertical layout, the component here. So I'll say H1 and grid, um, and we'll just add that and hit command shift F9. Now uh, it's gonna reset everything. Remember, it's gonna like go ahead and use dev tools. So, okay, good. If we go to the browser, local host, there's our data, right? Post by your favorite AI here, uh, et cetera. It's all kind of nonsense, but who cares, right? It's just, it's a very, very simple example. Um, Marcus, buddy, O'Pal, is there a way to make this sortable? Yes, it should be sortable by Default, but I'm thinking the problem might be here that we're using records and grid. I'm not like if if you oh. just pass in a list of beans, it would be sortable by default. I think we might need to do yeah. something here. It's nice. So let... Anyway, if if I can get this going in no time at all, you know, it's a pretty good deal, right? I, I'm a I'm a big fan. Okay, so friends, um, we're using uh, Vaden. We're using Vaden. Vaden is in turn using the servlet abstraction. You don't have to deal with that. You don't have to connect with any of that, but it's still there. You could use Spring MVC and, and all that. Um, one thing you may not have noticed is that by using uh, Spring Boot 3.0, um, which sits on top of the new Jakarta E APIs, is that if you were to use something like the servlet API, right, servlet uh, uh, request, for example, you'll notice that this type, our, our friend, the HTTP servlet request, has moved house. It's in a new package. And this, my friends, comes from a weird time in the Java ecosystem about five, six, I don't know, it was a long time ago, years ago, five years ago, let's say, uh, where Oracle just stopped responding to the community, right? The uh, the JCP came to a crash for the for Java EE, the JCP just came to a crashing halt and nothing got done for half a year or more. Uh, and eventually Oracle came back to the table long enough to open source these types. And so there was that weird moment in time when, because Oracle, by dint of having acquired Sun, was the lead of various specifications, nothing would get ratified because they weren't responding to emails. Uh, and so uh, they finally came back to the table and they agreed to open source 
these types, but you know, nothing's ever easy in the world, I guess. So they required that in order to open source it, uh, uh, to make it, you know, truly open for everybody so that no one company could stop it. Uh, they require that all changes, whether it be a method deletion or addition or type change or whatever, um, would ha have to happen in, in a new package. Okay. So package, uh, and, and, you know, this was all moved to the Eclipse Foundation. The Eclipse Foundation, to their unending credit, did an amazing job here. They did an amazing job um, by, uh, by basically solving as efficiently and elegantly with technical skill uh, what was essentially a legal problem that they couldn't have solved in, in, in a legal way. Uh, and so they, they released Java e, Jakarta EE8, uh, which is basically Java EE7 with a new license and the new TCK and new documents, right? New documentation. Then they released Jakarta EE9, which is exactly the same as 8, which is exactly the same as 7, except that um, they now had the new Jakarta package. And so what does this mean for you? Hopefully nothing. Hopefully you're using uh, the Vaadin and you're just sort of blissfully ignorant of all those types. If you're using JPA, you'll notice this. If you're using bean validation, you're going to notice this. But don't freak out. It is just a find and replace. There has been incredible, incredible pains that have uh, been taken to make sure that migration is just find and replace. Thanks to the Eclipse Foundation. Thanks to the ecosystem. Thanks to the Spring Team and so on. Remember, the Spring Team uh, are the lead contributors to Apache Tomcat, the sort of number one by a country mile uh, servlet spec implementer. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of care that's been taken in moving that forward and so on in such a way that it can be usable. Now, um, I you know it's actually a really good time to be on the servlet stack and to be using this new stuff because again, <laughs> Project Loom is just around the corner, right? You swap out a, a a an executor and you get the kind of scale you might have otherwise gotten by using this async servlet API or using Reactive or or something like that. Mark Thomas uh, Loom, he did a great blog. This one, this is a great blog from a few weeks ago, a few months ago. I don't know, it all kind of runs together, doesn't it? February 27, 2023, in which he talked about the high throughput and the lightweight nature of Loom when applied to a otherwise stock standard Spring MVC application on Tomcat, right? And basically, you know, without doing anything special, uh, what is the conclusions? Um, Web applications that experience blocking such as classic Spring MVC on Tomcat and have not switched to the serverless, servlet asynchronous API, reactive programming, or other asynchronous APIs should see some scalability improvements by switching to a virtual thread-based executor. Uh, depending on the web application, these improvements may be achievable with no code changes to the web application code. What that means, friends, is that you get the amazing, amazingly productive programming model of Vaadin uh, uh, along with some like amazing scalability opportunities here just by moving to Java 21 uh, and, and working on top of a, uh, like something like Spring Boot, okay? Just a really good deal, a really good deal for everybody. So these types, that's a good thing. It puts the ecosystem, it puts the community in a much better place. Things will finally change, right? Remember, we've had half a decade or more of like basically no changes in Jakarta EE. And finally, that's starting to like, you know, we're starting to see forward progress. It's a really good situation for us to be in. So friends, we have our view, we've got some data in the database. We've got our declarative HTTP client in Spring Boot. We're using test containers uh, to really rapidly iterate and to sort of uh, live our Git clone and run life. Uh, you know, we're using um, uh, Spring Boot's, uh, you know, e easy programming model and so on. Good stuff. Uh, I think we're ready to go to production, right? I think, and we're also on top of the Jakarta EE and we're using Java 17 and later. I think we're ready to go to production. And friends, when we do that, there's a couple of things that come to mind couple of things that people ask about. The first is, how do I take my application and put it inside of a container, right? Just just one container, by the way. Remember, this is both our web application on the client and our backend application. And we've just got one artifact. There's no distributed computing involved in any of this. You know, I think it's a simplifying uh, touch. So the question is, how do I take this application and put it into a container, an OCI image or whatever? And to that end, friends, uh, remember, do friends don't let friends write Docker files, right? We are gonna instead use uh, build packs, right? So build packs are a great way to containerize an application. They're not a new thing. This is not new to Spring Boot 3.x, but I do feel like it's worth mentioning uh, because it's been around for so long and people always ask, how do you do it, right? And can, uh, build packs are great. They let you take a, uh, a, an application, be it a .jar, .war, .uh, a Ruby on Rails application, a Python application, a .NET EXE or whatever, uh, and containerize it. So you put the application in using either the, the pack CLI or as we'll see in a second, the 
built-in support for Spring Boot uh, uh, in the build plugins. You can use this, uh, and you, you get a, an OCI image out that you can then Docker tag and Docker push to contain a registry of choice. This is great, right? I'm a big fan uh, of build packs. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to use this uh, like this. We're not going to use the pack CLI because again, Spring Boot has uh, support out of the box here. So what we can do if you're using Maven, MVNW Spring Boot colon build hyphen image, right? Um, that'll that'll work just fine. If you're using Gradle, you'll do uh, uh, build boot image. Okay, so I'm not going to do either one. It takes a little while and you know, I just want to like move on. So this is been it's, it's it's old news. You can just it's it's not new or anything. You can try it out, right? It's been there forever. Um, okay, so that's the first question. The second question, my friends, is how do we make when how do we package our application so as to be as efficient as possible? And this is really important, right? This efficiency is like you know, in the era of cloud infrastructure where every single uh, bit of usage of resource usage is metered, that's what that should be. Uh, it's valuable to be as efficient as possible, right? Uh, and I want to just start this discussion. I just want to say at first, you know, set the set the set the uh, uh, table stakes here. I think Java is a very efficient language. In fact, it's inarguably a very e efficient language. Here's a blog from oh, I don't know, uh, five uh, five years ago, 2018, asking the question: Which programming language uses the least electricity, or which programming languages use the least electricity? And there's a really great table down here, number four. Uh, that shows the normalized global results for energy, time, and memory. And I just love this table because, you know, you can see C is doing quite well there, obviously, in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of how much energy it takes to get to the end of a particular algorithm, for example. Um, so C is doing quite well there, unquestionably. Um, Rust, naturally, doing quite well there, right? There, there are zero-cost abstractions. Uh, C++, you know, if you have that much control over something, you should be able to get numbers like this. Ada, but who cares? And then Java, right? And Java, let's just round up, my friends. Let's just say that Java is like twice as inefficient as C. Can we say that? So we can say C is twice as efficient. It uses half as much energy for the equivalent thing as Java. And I'm rounding up. It's it's not exactly half, but you know what I mean. Basically, let's just give C the extra, extra points there, okay? Okay, so Java is doing... Uh, pretty good, right? It's in the top five most efficient languages already. That's before we've done anything special to it. And and by the way, this list, oh, this list is very confusing, right? Uh, first of all, JavaScript comes in at 4.45. Uh, okay, you know, it's fine. I mean, what they, what the Google team have done with V8 is just a modern uh, miracle. Amazing what they've done there. There's Go, right? Uh, there's Haskell and Swift and all the others, all these other languages. Here's TypeScript, which I don't understand. How do you, I thought this, I thought TypeScript turned into JavaScript. I don't understand how, what, what, 21? It's like four times worse than JavaScript, right? That's, okay. Anyway, moving on. These two languages, which shall remain forever nameless. Uh, and then, of course, one of my actual favorite languages, another one of my favorite languages, Python which comes in at 75, which is to say it's like 32 and a half times more inefficient than Java, right? <laughs> I don't understand how we got this number. But anyway, it's all that to say Java is doing quite well. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It's doing uh, really well as a language uh, in terms of efficiency. Um, and I think it's efficiency, it's speed, it owes to two particular things, OK? Uh, first of all, the garbage collector. The Java language's garbage collector is another one of those modern miracles. It's one of those things that, that just makes technology so, so mesmerizing, right? Uh, you can do such amazing things with a good garbage collector because it frees you conceptually to focus on higher order concerns like the abstraction and the business logic before you. Uh, that said, I do want to take issue with the idea that it's the first Java garbage collector. I think that honor goes to uh, this person named Jesslyn. Uh, she's a product manager from uh, a company in, I think, New York. Uh, she's a product manager, product management at Fanhouse. Uh, but she's also from the island of Java, Indonesia. So therefore, I think she has a stronger claim to being the Java garbage collector. And what I love about this tweet, my friends, what I love about this is that if you scroll down, you can see there are 20,000 people. I'm rounding up again. You know, uh, There are roughly 20,000 people that like this. That means at the intersection of programming languages, garbage collection, geography, Indonesia, and and like 
cleaning up garbage, uh, that Venn diagram, the intersection of all those different uh, data points is 19,000 people. I love the internet. Okay, so great. The, the garbage collector in the programming language is a miracle, right? I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, another thing that makes uh, Java so scalable, so efficient, so, so fast uh, is the just-in-time compiler. The just-in-time compiler is one of those things that you know you kind of just take for granted, but it's there, right? If you think about it, if you did you know that the just in, just in time compiler actually came after uh, Java 1.0? It was added later on, which meant that for a little while in Java's history, we had the unique uh, sort of dubious uh, distinction of being a interpreted language that still required you to compile it, right? Like normally when you compile, you get like native optimized code out of the uh, on the other side of it, but with with Java. You had to compile it, but it was still interpreted, which is like the worst of both worlds, right? I don't get the performance or the convenience or the ease of deployment or of, of iteration. But now we have the just-in-time compiler, which seems like a nice compromise. And what that is, is basically you can write your code and after enough successive runs, uh, the Java virtual machine where, uh, where it can be sure that you're not registering new types and doing anything super dynamic, uh, it can take your code and turn it into operating system and architecture specific native code. And this is a great win, right? Because uh, you know you can actually get performance on par with the likes of C and, and so on in certain code paths, but only in the places where you're not using the runtime. Remember, Java, for all of its stodginess, all of its syntax words, uh, et cetera, is actually very dynamic. It actually has a lot more in common with the likes of Lua and Ruby and Python and JavaScript and whatever than it does the likes of of C or Rust or whatever, right? It's a it's got a dynamic runtime. You can do things like reflection and serialization and proxies and uh, you know uh, um, um, what's the other one I'm missing? Uh, proxy serialization, reflection, resource loading, right? You can load things uh, from the from the the jar, etc. You have all this extra. All these extra concepts that a lot, a lot of languages just don't have, uh, and this makes it a very dynamic language. And it's one of the reasons why the Java community is so amazingly productive. I mean, just look at what we're doing with Vaadin here, right? This is a, a magic trick. I, I still can't quite understand. It's just an amazing boon to productivity. Uh, but that dynamic behavior can sometimes frustrate a optimizing compiler, such as the just-in-time compiler. So what? What the just-in-time compiler does is it finds code that executes a lot at runtime and that doesn't have any of this sort of dynamic behavior, and it compiles just that code. But And the results speak for themselves. Large organizations like Google and Alibaba and so on, they take those applications uh, that they've got and they warm them up before they loose them into production. They run them 100,000 times or something like that to warm up the just-in-time compiler to trigger the comp compilation to native code, and then they turn that production traffic onto that application. The results are amazing, right? Really, really amazing. Um, and uh, you know, I think they speak for themselves a lot of times. If they're so good, however, the question then is, why can't we just proactively compile everything to native code, right? Seems reasonable. I mean, we do have that sort of dynamic stuff we need to worry about. So let's, let's say there was some mechanism by which we could provide configuration that told this ahead of time compiler about those dynamic behaviors so that it, it could account for them and sort of like, you know, provide a shim to make it work. What if we had that? Could we do something interesting here? Well, that's the core conceit of GraalVM, right? GraalVM is an open JDK distribution. It's a drop-in replacement for open JDK, um, but it has some extra niceties, in, including a polyglot language runtime called Truffle, uh, which lets you use different languages in the same process basically. Uh, and it has a native image compiler, an AOT or ahead of time compiler. And that compiler is really, really powerful, but you do need to provide some configuration to tell it about all these things that are very dynamic, right? So that it doesn't uh, trip up on those dynamic things. And that configuration comes in the form of JSON. And by the way, I've I've uh, I've been asking recently, and I've decided that there's actually you know not 100% consensus on this. I don't know where in the world you are when you watch this webinar, but uh, as a as a person who speaks English, I would say JSON. Uh, but obviously, in in other languages, they might pronounce it differently. And if I'm honest with you, as a person who also speaks French, I I quite like the French version, JSON, right? JSON. It's much more elegant. I think we should all be pronouncing it like that. Okay. So motion to to uh, you know move to that presentation, uh, all in favor, say aye, okay? Put it in the chat, I just wanna know. I think JSON 
sounds better. We'd all sound cooler if we uh, pronounce it as such in meetings and technical discussions and so on. Anyway, somebody has to furnish all this JSON for all these dynamic behaviors in the application. Okay, uh, and so we, Spring, that is, and Vaadin uh, as, as frameworks are in a very sort of natural place to furnish this configuration for you on your behalf because we are, of course, uh, able to see a lot of this. And, we, and Spring also now has a new AOT component model so that if you find some use case where the default uh, JSON generated for your application isn't sufficient, if there's some corner that uh, you've got that isn't visible to the frameworks, then you can provide your own as well. Okay, so this is a new feature in Spring Framework 6 and in Spring Boot 3.0. It's a huge feature. It took us years to sort of uh, find the right balance here so that we can preserve most applications. The very, very large majority of applications should just be, uh, you know, it should be simple enough to move them to Spring Boot 3 and then take advantage of this new um, mechanism. It's really, really powerful. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take advantage of that. It's a new feature, like I said. So we're going to do Gradle native compile. Now, before I do this, uh, there's a thing that's related to re the, you know, the, the scanning that Vaadin does for certain uh, packages. So we need to exclude or uh, you know, to whitelist uh, certain packages. So we're going to say com.vaadin. We're going to say we want org.vaadin. We want dev.hilla if you're using Hilla, which is also awesome. We're going to use an, our own package, which is beautiful Vaadin. So if you go to the, uh, the Vaadin application, you scroll up, you can see it says com example Vaadin. Oops, I have to give it a useful name. So there, com example Vaadin. Um, and, uh, and there we go. So we've got that. Now we're going to go ahead and kick off a GraalVM native image compilation. Let's go ahead and make sure it gets underway. Because we had a, if you get an issue, um, then you can just do npm install first. Okay. Oh, the other thing, whoops, I forgot to do that. Uh, the other thing we need to do is to make it so that it uses the production build. So we'll say production mode equals true, okay? Let's stop that, RMRF build, and then we'll start the compilation again. So that's gonna kick off. We'll let it do its thing. And, and the problem, I'm not gonna lie to you, friends, this is gonna take a minute. It'll take a little while to do its work. And remember, what it's doing is it's doing an analysis of all the types in the class path and looking at all the types that those types are using and all the types that those types are using and so on and so on down the line until such time as it arrives at a graph that are of, of reachable types starting from the main method and outward, moving outward, okay? Now that an analysis happens for every type in the class path, every type in your code, every type anywhere. Uh, and so it takes a little while. You can actually see if you have one of those things, if you have one of those sort of machines where you still have to worry about fans, you might actually hear it, right? It actually, uh, it, it can actually kick things up and take a fair bit of RAM in the meantime. Uh, and it takes a while and it takes enough time, if I'm honest with you friends, that frankly, I get kicked out of the zone. Right, I, I lose my focus. I I have a hard time keeping, uh, you know, hewing to to my task because I just I I just lose the flow, right? And it's not long enough that I can do something useful, right? I it, it's just long enough that I get distracted. Now I'm finally, unfortunately, somebody who understands this cartoon, right? This cartoon uh, is the famous XKCD cartoon, right? Amazing ca cartoon uh, where they ask the number one program excuse for legitimately slacking off my code's compiling, right? I never understood this joke before because who are these people that have languages that take enough time that you can do something interesting in your life while it's compiling? I didn't get it. I mean, for a while we had like WebSphere that took a long enough time to reset and cycle, but but compiling, I just didn't get that, right? But now here we are, you know, for better or for worse, we're part of that group of people. And it's long enough, like I said, you can't really respond to email or get up or go to the bathroom or, uh, like, you know, you're just, you're just sitting there, your hand, uh, holding your head, just sitting there like this, waiting and waiting and waiting. And eventually, uh, you know, I started to get bored. I started to get bored and I, uh, I start to hear elevator music. And I, you know, I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if, wouldn't it be nice if everybody could hear elevator music? And so, and so I asked, you know, cause it doesn't hurt to ask. I asked, I said, I said, Oracle, please, this is the Oracle Gravium project, right? I said, Please play elevator music during the native, Im native image compilation process. Okay, great. So, so I asked that, uh, and I said, I said, I already hear elevator music in my head while I do these sometimes long running compilations. I just like everybody else to hear it too. Thank you in advance, and I appreciate your amazing work. Uh, and and I do, by the way, I really do. I really appreciate all the amazing things they're doing for us. And I got some great responses. Right uh, here's one from 
for Andrew Din, who's a distinguished engineer on the Red Hat Java team. Very nice response. He said, please play this elevator music. I'm not going to play it, but here's the YouTube video. And basically, it's, it's the soundtrack to the Nintendo 64 video game. So it's not the original movie. It's not the James Bond GoldenEye movie. It's the game based on the movie, and it's a soundtrack based on the game. Okay. And so there's this elevator music, which being honest with you, yeah, that would be perfect. I would I would approve of that if we could if we could have that. And then somebody else said that uh, he says uh, or, uh, they said I would add that using beeps in general, not only for native image, really helped me reduce the development time. Yeah, that's great actually. That really would be amazing. I mean, uh, my freaking toaster can ding when it's done. Why can't my million million line of code uh, compiler? That seems super reasonable. I would be happy with that as well. And, and I thought that was good enough, but then I got this great response from Fabio Niepaus, right? Fabio is a researcher on the Gravium team at Oracle Labs. He's a PhD, he's a, one of, he's a doctor, one of my favorite doctors, along with Dr. Seuss, who, Strange, Subramaniam, Devolder, Sire, Pollock, uh, and, and so on, okay? So he's a, he's a, he gave me a great response. He says, thank you for your feature request, Josh. The problem with playing music during the compilation process is that it's just fixing the symptoms and we've been and are still working on the cause, making Gravium native images more efficient in terms of time, memory, and CPU consumption. Okay. Anyway, he continues, I have prototyped a dash dash Josh Long mode. And that's what this would have been. So basically, basically you would go You'd, you'd say native image, that's the compiler, dash, dash, Josh Long mode, and it would print out music brought to you by Josh Long. And then, you know, then it would, of course, play the music, and then it would show this ASCII artwork, which I think I think would have been cool, right? That would have been, that would have been great. Uh, uh, so, okay, so what happened? So anyway, I have prototyped a dash, dash, Josh Long mode. Again, the future I want to live in, that's, that's the one. But for some reason, I have, the, oh, but for some reason, I have the feeling my PR will be rejected, probably because of the copyrighted music. Oh, foiled again. So on a more serious note, he continues, yes, we could probably add a dash dash ring bell when done option that prints the bell code after the compilation process. <sighs> it's progress. It's not what we deserve. It's, it's, the, it's the feature we need, not the feature we deserve. OK, so great. So uh, I don't know what we were doing. What were we doing? Oh yeah, the compilation. Oh, but it's done now. Let's see. Nope, it failed. So we have a. Uh, this is the JavaScript side. <laughs> Get it out of my face. Disgusting. Let me see here. Go here. npm. Install. Just install everything. Just take my internet. And see, it's even. It it, it knew something was wrong. It wanted me to do that. Okay, native compile. Let that run again. If it asks you to do that, just let it. Just do it. Just. What could go wrong? Just download everything, okay? Now this is, this also reminds me of, uh, what did I just do here? Did I make a change here? Yeah, there. It reminds me of uh, my friend, Matt Rabel, uh, who, okay, what happened now? Why can't we have nice things? NPM install. Okay. JavaScript. Reminds me of my friend, Matt Rabel, who does, he's very brave. He'll do, uh, you know, 20 lines of Spring Boot code, and then, then he'll code generate tens of thousands of lines of JavaScript to court, to complement that. Okay, npm install, please. Okay, so there we go, native compile. Uh -huh. All right, let's, let's hope it works. Oh, I'm hoping. I'm hoping, and, and you can see what it's doing there, by the way. One of the things that we do in the, oh, son of a gun. Let's see here, what happened? Vite. Yeah, this is like something that was new for this morning. We ran through this yesterday, no issues, so. Yeah, and we ran through it once this morning, which is fine. What is the issue with this? Do I have to like, just, we just kept running it, right? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing special there. So it says, uh, vit dep. Okay, build cannot find module path is absolute. I don't yeah. know why you would. It was that. always, yeah, it was a different one each time. So I don't know. One. We kept running it and eventually it worked. So this is clearly something we need to look into. It does work 
I don't think this has anything at all to do with Graal VM or no. anything. So I think Isn't we'll have to share a link to the. Is it better? JS just work. Okay, let's just keep going. Keep going. It's making progress. It's failing uh, continuously, which is <laughs> that's, that's basically yeah, the whole. I've thing. heard you. You need to fail fast, so we're. It's JavaScript. You can. Make... There's no thing as failing fast. It's just very slow. Let's see here. Uh, just no. Same one. We're, we're stuck there. Wonder why? What if we got the Varden production mode, right? Is there anything yeah. else I needed? No, that should be it. Hmm. Did yeah? Try try removing your Node modules folder and just let it like do it from. Oh, is there one from start? What would it be? Oh, maybe it's in a. So used right. to using. Somebody's yeah. asking if you forgot to pray to the demo gods this morning. Might it, have been that. I have a target directory for some reason. I just got rid of that too. Huh. Well, that's unexpected. It, it, yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Cannot find source map codec. I mean, it's not wrong. I just don't know why it thinks it should be able to find it. Okay, no. target. Where's the build? There's a build directory and a target directory. So, okay, error module not found. Resolve. Asking if we're missing the Maven plugin, but we're not using Maven, so that should not be the case here. And Global. we did get this working yesterday and this morning. So, and Global themed like the last straw last time when we had this weird fluke of an issue this morning. Yeah, I think I need to unleash the Arthur on on this issue to get it sorted. New errors. Okay, we're well, now we're failing in TypeScript. Okay, good. What is the issue? Okay, I'm always good to fail in TypeScript. It's redundant. Come on. Come on. Because I don't remember this morning, like this happened once and then it uh, magically fixed itself. Now, magic. obviously, being live, it's not going to happen. I don't get it. Like oh, npm install, is that the thing that we did that was different? npm install. Oh, because I just deleted those two different directories. Yeah. Okay. Hold me a compile. That's a 12 seconds last time, or like 13. Now, well, I'm going to call that a, 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 a an L, you know, not a W. Yeah. Very sad. What is this well, issue? Yeah, go ahead and not able to find share what you have with me after this, and I'll I'll figure out what's happening. Ribbons to npm. Uh oh, <laughs> you see that? Uh, oh. No, now we're now we're in dangerous <laughs> wires. I think as, as can be. So let's see. Target great old W native compile. Yeah. Oh, Santa Maria. Anyway, meantime. zip up this project, whatever you have right now, just so I can sure. figure out what's what's wrong. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, some sort of ambient weirdness. Wait, is it no? Okay, it's just it's it's well and truly sad, but we'll get it. So, okay, I I hope. Do I have another version of this code? I hope I do. Yes, here. So this, uh, you know, the one we were just working in right here is downloads Vaden, but. CD desktop Vaden, right? And I've got build native compiler. It's already built, I think, compile. since this yeah. morning. So we can right. just assume that it worked. Yeah. Vaden. And you can see that was built on May 4th at 840 AM. It's now 950. So now this is going to run, but the problem is it's got no data source, right? Because I don't, I'm using test containers. So I've got this little script here called desktop uh, talk. 
And I've got a little script here called run. And basically, I'm going to set the environment variable, spring data source URL, spring data source password and username. And I'm going to tell it to run this. So let me update that script here to point to the desktop instead of my uh, download directory. Uh, let's say run. And we're going to say desktop button build blah, blah, blah. OK, so first things first, cd desktop talk docker compose up to spin up a, the, the database to which it's going to connect. And then we'll say desktop talk run, and that's going to run the environment variable and start up the application. So there's the, there's the application. It started up, you can see, lightning fast, right? Like faster than a, a light bulb. So it's all the post data, right? Where's the uh, application? Hello. There's the, uh, the application. Great, up and running in like two tenths of a second, basically, which is fine, but Vaadin isn't a serverless framework, so uh, that's not the main use case here. What I care about, friends, is we can take that application and grab the process identifier here, and you can look at the memory. So PSO minus, uh, PS minus O RSS and pass in the process identifier. It's taking about 168 megs of RAM. That's a good deal. That's a probably 5x or more uh, decrease in memory footprint for your application, which, you know, it's a good deal. It's fast and it takes less memory. And by the way, that situation with Loom gets even better. So if you go to Twitter uh, and you look at Alina Yurenko, uh, a friend and developer advocate on the Gravium, no, Alina Yurenko, a developer advocate on the Gravium team, she and Thomas Wertinger were talking about um, the uh, the cost of, here you go, look at this. They're talking about, with GraalVM, you can run 100,000 virtual threads with 100 megs of memory and 6% CPU. So now imagine, you know, whatever, another 100 megs, but now unparalleled scale, right? If you're using the JVM, it would take, in, in native, in this example, they're running virtual threads that shows GraalVM's native images, not only to reduce the memory footprint, but also the CPU usage of Java apps significantly. So 100,000 th 100, threads native, you know, a tenth of a, a gig, 100 megs at 6%. JVM, 1.25 gigs for the same amount of threads. With, with native, you can do a million virtual threads with, a, with only a gig versus almost four gigs on the JVM at 558% CPU utilization. So... Imagine having a virtual a million clients. You know, you'd be limited at that point by HTTP session state or whatever. Imagine having a million, you know, people talking to your Vaadin application at the same time with one node. Right? That's a really good place to be. Project Loom, GraalVM, awesome. So, my friends, I hope you learned something. I hope you got something out of this discussion. Uh, it's we just looked at a few of the nice things in uh, Spring Boot 3.x, including the new uh, test container support to make sure that you're rinse, reset, or recycles uh, sort of time is as fast as possible. We looked at GraalVM, but of course the demo gods did not uh, abide us this one time. Um, but yeah, basically you do what we just did and you'll get the right result sooner rather than later. Uh, I hope you got something out of this. Hope you had fun. And Marcus, it's always good to see you as well, my friend. So yep. with that, I think we're ready to take questions. Yeah, well, let's see here. Got a bunch of questions coming in. So one was asking, so Benno was asking, does this native compiling work with Maven? Yes, yes, it does. And it did work with Gradle this morning too. So what we were seeing, the issues we were seeing are not related to GraalVM native compiling. They are related to something in the Vaadin front end compile. Good news being here that as of 24.1, which is due out here in about two weeks, we have eliminated that step from the build process for most applications. Uh, so with the, that, again, we'll have one one fewer thing that could go wrong in a live stream like this and in your day-to-day -day development world. So uh, Great. that's you know good that. news, I think. Cool. All right. Um, somebody's asking if you have a Montreal accent. Not sure. Montreal? Well, <laughs> am I drunk? I don't know. I, I wish. It's a little early in the morning, though. Uh, <laughs> Montreal accent. I mean, you know. In French, people get confused because my French doesn't. People from France ask if I'm Canadian. People from Canada ask if I'm from somewhere they don't know about in France. You know, it's just very strange. Uh, let's see. Anyway, here, here are two kind of good, good related questions. So one is, uh, is Docker desktop mandatory to be installed for building the test containers shown? Yes, but you can use a, 
I think Podman and things like that. You know, there's those are alternatives, but you need a, a daemon of some sort. Yeah, yeah. And the other one is also about uh, building uh, containers. So, is there a way to build containerized native images from a Graal VM? So essentially, yeah. the build packs will work with that as well. Uh, yes, they will. You set the, you know, the um, uh, the profile, and not the profile. The um, yeah, yes, yes, it is, and it's ask, actually as cool as you think. It's cooler because remember, GraalVM native images build an operating system and architecture specific build. So on your operating system, if you're running on the Mac as I am or Windows or whatever, you're going to get a Windows binary, which isn't going to help you at all if you're deploying to Linux, right? So uh, you know, which is statistically most of us are. Um, and so if you're building a, if you're using test containers, if you're, if you're using that, it'll actually compile the Java code in the Linux container producing a Linux binary so that when you then Docker tag and Docker push that, uh, that um, uh, container, you'll get, a, you'll get a Linux binary, right? That's great. You can actually do, that's the one example where you can kind of trick, you know, have this little trick and, uh, and do cross compilation. Alternatively, uh, by the way, there's a GitHub action that you can use and GitHub actions is just an example, but they have um, matrix builds. Lots of CI environments have matrix builds. So you can say, I want to run this and run the same pipeline on Windows and then run it again on Mac and then run it again on, on Linux. And so you can, if you're building a CLI, for example, with Spring Boot in, and Spring Shell, you want like a native bi binary, myapp.exe or myapp.whatever. Uh, and uh, you can get the same binary compiled three different times at, cool. out of one run. So uh, Project Loom question. Uh, with Project Loom, would you use Spring Web Reactive or Spring Web MVC? I mean... I'm all about that reactive life, but uh, if you're using MVC and you're in it for the scalability, and in here we, we, we've got, you know, you can use reactive types in our Spring MVC application, but it's not through and through altogether reactive. And so in this case, it's you get the best of both worlds. You get BOD and you get the serverlet API, you get this imperative API, and you get great Loom scalability. So I would, you yeah. know. All right. And Mike is asking if you're planning to share the github repo for this project yeah of course uh github yeah. oh, where, where did we put it we have it on we have right? it somewhere we'll definitely share the link and hopefully we'll you. debug debug the native compile so it works when folks actually check it out i paste I, i'll put the code in here i think we have it. can i i'll paste the one we've got okay uh, yeah i don't know if it's going to show up here for everyone but at least we'll share it with the email later on where am i uh, Bill is asking why the Gradle change in Spring Initializer. Uh, when, so there, this is it. Josh Long, beautiful VOD and webinar 2023-524. So grab that for your own reference. Um, okay, so yeah. now, so how do I share? Okay, why Gr Gradle? Um, Again, it wasn't, it was sort of, because remember, half the Spring team uses Maven and half of us use Gradle. So it wasn't like a, just sort of, we see that more people are starting to use Gradle than not. Uh, and our, uh, I guess, the sense of the Spring Boot team and the, uh, the people that made this decision was that for the 80% case, it, Gradle is, and this is, I, th I think, fairly uncontroversial, much more concise, right? Like five lines versus 50 for a pretty stock standard application. Uh, and then for the complex stuff, um, if you're, you know, I took a, a Gradle course and the thing I discovered was you're, you're, you're made to understand that Gradle is really extendable, really. Like it's just secondhand to create tasks out of the get, you know, from the get go. So whereas with Maven, I don't know if you've ever tried creating your own custom mojo, your own Maven plugin, but it's you know, not great. But on the other hand, Maven has this richness of ecosystem. But on the other, other hand, so does Gradle too now at this point, right? It's it's more than 10 years old. It's got all the common case use cases are already well cared for there. So, you know, neither one's going away. I, I think we're just saying for the, uh, we're optimizing for the person starting their journey in Java and for the person who just wants the most concise way to go. If you're using Maven and you're comfortable with it, then by all means use that. All right. With that, I think we are going to wrap up. We have still weren't able to kind of hit all the questions, but we are somewhat over time. And I know some of you are late for meetings and whatnot. So let's end here. We'll try to answer some of those other questions. I'll, I'll kind of 
go through them and and provide some answers in the follow up email. So if you're signed up here, we'll try to get answers for those as well. Uh, Josh, thank you so much for coming uh, for uh, <laughs> defying the demo gods. And unfortunately, we didn't come up on top this time, but we'll sort out what happened and and share. I'll update the code accordingly. So hopefully, everyone who is interested in trying this out locally will have a much better time than we did here on the stream. No doubt. Uh, I mean, or we, we had a good time before the stream and we'll probably have a great time after the stream. Maybe sure. it's the Schrodinger's, you know, demo kind of aspect. By observing it, we're ruining it. That is very possible. Anyway, thank you everyone for joining and hope to see you in a, another stream some other time. So thanks for joining and see you later. Bye. Bye.